Uh, I know that many of you have not been with us um, throughout this soul shift. This is about, I think, the fourth week now. Uh, And this morning we're talking about the soul shift from seen to unseen. Uh, And when I say soul shift, that may be a concept that's unfamiliar to you. Let me uh, give you this quote from the book. It says, we'll call these changes that happen in a person after they become a follower of Christ, we'll call them shifts. And when they occur at the deepest, most fundamental level of our being, we'll call them soul shifts. A soul shift is not the same as getting saved or deciding to follow Jesus. A soul shift is a change in the deepest part of our being, usually after we are saved and before we die, that makes us more like Christ and less like our old selves. We may be saved, have repented, and decided to follow Jesus. All of that is good, and if we died today, we would still go to heaven. But heaven has not yet come into us. Our souls may be saved, but they are not yet converted. They have not shifted. Uh, And as we begin this series, uh, we've talked about seven shifts. So far, we've covered me to you, a shift in thinking about myself and my needs to focusing on others. Uh, And if I can remember the next one, I think it's, what's the next one? Slave to child. Uh, I get them confused into what order. Uh, Slave to child, which we discussed uh, last week, is is focused less on serving God and more on loving God. And we discussed that this morning in the Sunday school hour. Uh, And today we're going to talk about seen to unseen. I don't know if we have any uh, Indiana Jones fans, uh, but I happen to be one. Uh, Harrison Ford fan, really, and Indiana Jones was one of those reasons. Uh, But in one of his movies, The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones is seeking the Holy Grail. And that's kind of the gist of all the movies, if you're not familiar with it, is he's seeking some ancient relic or archaeological uh, artifact. Uh, And as he's approaching the end of the movie to the Holy Grail, he finds that there's these three things, three challenges or tests uh, that he has to accomplish to get into the room uh, where the Grail is. And, And one of them... Uh, He comes uh, kind of out of this cave and he finds that he's standing on the edge of this cliff with just a big big valley or a big hole in the ground. Uh, And there is apparently no way across. Well, he has this book of clues to guide him. Uh, And he says, uh, whoever is seeking the grail will take uh, a leap of faith uh, from the lion's head. And as the movie goes on, Indiana Jones is standing there who's typically in the movie not a person of a religious faith. Uh, but believes there's some sort of mystical force around all these religious artifacts. And he's standing there, and he, you can see he's taking a deep breath and puts his hand over his heart, and he's summing up this religious belief, and he, he puts his foot out in front of him, and the camera angle goes on his boot, you know, and he's just going to take a leap out onto this thing. And as he steps down, it turns out that there's a walkway right in front of him. Uh, and as the camera moves, you could see that it was hidden by the background. It had been there the whole time, but you couldn't see it until the angle was changed. And he steps down, and he kind of sees it and goes on. And, of course, he gets, the, he gets the prize in the end, the Holy Grail and so forth. Well, he doesn't get it, though. They end up losing it. He does get it, but then they end up losing it. And you know how movies go. So anyway, uh, I thought of that idea of this leap of faith as we talk about from seen to unseen. As Indiana Jones could not see that path that was right in front of him, until he stepped out. There are so many similarities uh, in the Christian life. Uh, if you've been a believer or follower of Christ for very long, you have possibly run into some people who seem to see spiritual things that others don't see, or at least seem to pick up on them quicker. Um, and they are, I would call them people of faith. And we're going to look at some of them this morning. And what better place is to, to look at people of faith than in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, where the author of that book uh, we now call this the faith chapter, but this the author of the Hebrews chapter 11 lists several people through the Old Testament, and we're going to look at a few of them this morning and says, what is it about them that made them able to take this leap of faith or take that step out? Uh, but before we get there, in the book of Colossians, I need to establish sort of a premise, a working premise with you this morning. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, Paul says this, and this is on the screen, Paul tells us something that we easily skip over. You've heard this verse before in Colossians 1.16. It says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Now, you've probably read that verse many times and know this, referring to the person of Jesus Christ, that he was at creation and all those sorts of things. But what we need to see is that from this verse we can understand that there are things that God has created and is doing that we are not able to see. 
And I need to establish that premise before we move forward this morning. God created things visible and invisible, things that your naked eye cannot see. And if we read this verse correctly, we get the idea that there's a whole different world of things. And Steve referred to this in the video. There's a whole different set of things, perhaps even a bigger reality of things going on that we are unfamiliar with or cannot see. And when we make this shift that we're talking about this morning from seen to unseen, we begin to think more about those things than about the things that we can see. And our minds become set on those things and our thoughts revolve around the unseen. You see, in our situation that we live in today, we are very driven, and you probably know this as well as I do, we are very driven by what we see. And it's so easy for us to get focused on the circumstances and the things that we see going on around us. Uh, And that's often what we pray about, the things that are visible to us. And all we see are the obstacles in front of us and the things that are holding us back, the illnesses, the financial problems, the unemployment, the relationship issues, all those sort of things that slow us down. I read a story a few years ago, uh, and it's sort of lengthy, uh, but I wanted to share with, it, with you this morning because I think it's profitable for us. There was once a fellow who, with his dad, farmed a little piece of land. Several times a year, they would load up the old ox cart drawn with vegetables, excuse me, the old ox drawn cart with vegetables, and go into the nearest city to sell their produce. Except for their name and the patch of ground, father and son had little in common. The old man believed in taking it easy. The boy was usually in a hurry, the go-getter type. One morning, bright and early, they hitched up the ox to the loaded cart and started on the long journey. The son figured that if they walked faster, kept going all day and night, they'd make market by early the next morning. So he kept prodding the ox with a stick, urging the beast to get a move on. Take it easy, son, said the old man. You'll last longer. But if we get to market ahead of the others, we'll have a better chance of getting good prices, argued the son. No reply. Dad just pulled his hat down over his eyes and fell asleep on the seat. Itchy and irritated, the young man kept goading the ox to walk faster. His stubborn pace refused to change. Four hours and four miles later down the road, they came to a little house. The father woke up smiled and said, here's your uncle's place, let's stop in and say hello. But we've lost an hour already, complained the hotshot. Then a few more minutes won't matter. My brother and I live so close, yet we see each other so seldom, the father answered slowly. The boy fidgeted and fumed while the two old men laughed and talked away almost an hour. On the move again, the man took his turn, leading the ox. As they approached a fork in the road, the father led the ox to the right. The left is the shorter way, said the son. I know it, replied the old man, but this way is much prettier. Have you no respect for time, the young man asked impatiently. Oh, I respect it very much. That's why I like to use it to look at beauty and enjoy each moment to the fullest. The winding path led through graceful meadows, wildflowers, and along a rippling stream, all of which the young man missed as he churned within. Preoccupied and boiling with anxiety, he didn't even notice how lovely the sunset was that day. Twilight found them in what looked like a huge, colorful garden. The old man breathed in the aroma, listened to the bubbling brook, and pulled the ox to a halt. Let's sleep here, he sighed. This is the last trip I'm taking with you, snapped the sun. You're more interested in watching sunsets and smelling flowers than in making money. Why, that's the nicest thing you've said in a long time, smiled the dad. A couple of minutes later, he was snoring, and his boy glared back at the stars. The night dragged slowly. The sun was restless. Before sunrise, the young man hurriedly shook his father awake. They hitched up and went on. About a mile down the road, they happened upon another farmer, a total stranger trying to pull his cart out of a ditch. Let's give him a hand, whispered the old man. And lose more time, the boy exploded. Relax, son, you might be in a ditch sometime yourself. We need to help others in need. Don't forget that. The boy looked away in anger. It was almost 8 o'clock that morning by the time the, the other cart was back on the road. Suddenly a great flash split the sky. What sounded like thunder followed. Beyond the hills, the sky grew dark. Looks like a big rain in the city, said the old man. If we had hurried, we'd be almost sold out by now, grumbled his son. Take it easy, you'll last longer. 
and you'll enjoy life so much more, counseled the kind old gentleman. It was late afternoon. By the time they got to the hill overlooking the city, they stopped and stared down at it for a long, long time. Neither of them said a word. Finally, the young man put his hand on his father's shoulder and said, I see what you mean, Dad. They turned their cart around and began to roll slowly away from what had once been the city of Hiroshima. Too often, we see what's in front of us. And we miss what God is actually doing in our, in our lives. And we get a different perspective. So as we begin this morning in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, I want us to pray and ask God to help us begin to see the things that are unseen. Father, we come to you this morning and we realize that we are people driven uh, by circumstances, by things that we see around us. Uh, we are aware of this shift that you want to make in us. And as we look at your word this morning, as we see examples of those who lived by faith, we pray that you begin that work in us, uh, continue it for those who have already began, help us to uh, find the truth of your word to ring true in our hearts as well, and cause us to change and become the people that you need us to be. Uh, We pray that your spirit would attend the reading and the hearing of your word, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The first thing we need to see this morning, and you've probably already figured it out, is that when we make this shift from seen to unseen, it requires faith. And that's why we're in the faith chapter here in Hebrews chapter 11. One of the best ways for us to observe this truth in Scripture is from the examples that we see in Hebrews chapter 11. You look at verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Or maybe it says... Uh, being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Uh, one pass, one version translates this verse, it's our handle on what we can't see. Now you've probably been in church for many years and you've heard the idea of faith and you realize the importance of Hebrews chapter 11, that there's an aspect of a belief in Christ that requires an element of faith and believing in something that you can't see. None of us has witnessed visibly the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is talking about Uh, with Thomas in John chapter 20 verse 29 the verses that we read this morning blessed are those who who believe and have not seen now according to this verse faith does what it does and keeps doing what should be doing even when the things that it hopes for cannot be seen even though we cannot see faith working it is still working it is still doing something and when this shift occurs in us we begin to operate from a position of faith instead of a position of vision uh, now, you probably have coworkers or family members or friends or someone who is locked in to being able to prove everything. Uh, I run across many people who say, well, I can't believe, I can't have faith in God, there's just not enough evidence or not enough proof. Uh, and what I find in most cases is they've not really examined the evidence, honestly. And the second part is that they have no faith in them. They must be slaves to their vision and what they can calculate and formulate and all those sort of things. But Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things that we hope for. And in verse 6, it says another important uh, verse about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, We walk by faith, not by sight. We are inherently people of faith. I don't take that as a, uh, as a, a bad thing when people say, Oh, you're people of faith. I consider that a good thing. It means we believe in something that is unseen. Uh, Now, in the media and many other places in the world today, calling someone a person of faith is not meant as a compliment. It's usually meant as a derogatory statement saying you don't believe in facts and evidence and proof and all those sort of things. But as I thought about this idea this week about us being people of faith, I came up with three aspects of God that we need to have faith in. Uh, And you can just make these in your bulletin on your own. Uh, But they'll be on the screen for you. And the first one is this. When we talk about being people of faith, we need to have faith in the promises of God. We need to have faith in His goodness and trust in Him. We need to have faith that He will do what He says. Now, Scripture is full of things, but if we don't believe that God is going to actually do what He promises or what He says, it doesn't really mean anything to us. So that's the first part thing that we need to have faith in. In verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11... It's talking about Abraham. And in verse 8 it says, And he went out, 
not knowing where he was going. Abraham had not seen the place where God was taking him. Abraham had faith in the unseen after God had promised him to make his descendants as numerous as the seashore, as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And God gives him that promise in Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and takes him to a place that he's not seen. And the story continues though because you remember in the, in the life of Abraham he's headed up the mountain to sacrifice his only son Isaac. His only son. Remember God has promised him that his descendants will be as many as the sand on the seashore and now God has asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. So they climb the mountain, Abraham and Isaac, and Isaac's looking around and there's nothing else to sacrifice. And he asks Abraham, he says, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. He trusted in the promises of God that Abraham was going to be a great nation. And here God is now asking him to sacrifice his only son. Yet he had faith in the promise of God. God tells him, I'll give you many descendants. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, God, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Now, I hope that, in, there, that I have a group of you here this morning that believes that God is faithful, and he will do it, and has faith in the promises of God. Can I get an amen there? Because it's very important that if God is a, is a God of faithfulness and trust, he needs to fulfill his promises. And I'm here to tell you this morning that he is good and faithful even when you can't see it. And he will fulfill his promises. In Psalms chapter 20 it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's where your faith is at. When my vision tells me that everything is all wrong, faith tells me that it's all right. You see how I've moved from a thing that I see to a thing that is unseen. So not only do we need to have faith in God's promises, the second thing, we need to have faith in His power, in His ability, in His strength. So it's not only that He will do what He has promised, it's that He can do. Does He have the ability, the power, to move in such a way to fulfill His promises? I can promise you many things this morning and have a desire to make them come true, but if I don't have the power to make it come true, it's irrelevant. He is able to do what he promises. Now Sarah also appears, Abraham's wife in chapter 11. And in her, God does something that is entirely supernatural. You remember the story when he tells, Abraham, he tells Sarah that she will have a child and she laughs because she's 9,900 years old. In the realm of possibility, it's not very likely at all. And if you step away from faith, you would just say, it's not going to happen, Sarah. But she made it into the faith chapter, didn't she, in chapter 11? And so did Abraham. In verse 11, it says about Sarah, she considered him faithful who had promised. She considered him faithful who had promised. And in the life of Sarah, we see the promise of God fulfilled. Not just a promise, but using his supernatural power, he does that. The third thing we need to believe about God and have faith in this morning is in his providence. That he actually is ultimately concerned for your welfare. We can have faith in his character, have confidence in him. Faith that he is doing what he says. And I think this is probably the most difficult one for us this morning. We need to have faith that he will take care of us. He is working to provide and protect you, and often in ways that you don't see. And as I said, I think this is the most difficult shift for us. Uh, I shared, I think I shared this story on Wednesday with our, our prayer meeting. Uh, that, well, you've seen Tanya's and I's van. It's several years old. Well, we've had a, uh, an engine light on on it for, I don't know, several years now. Um, and we took it in and they said, oh, it's just the exhaust and this has happened on another van. So we weren't too worried about it. Well, in the meantime, uh, we had also been noticing a red fluid on the floor of my garage, which my father being a mechanic, I know that's one of two things. It's either power steering fluid or it's transmission fluid. I'm just hoping that it was overfilled when they serviced it and it's just kind of leaking out. Well, it turns out it was transmission fluid because in the last week or so, we've been noticing the colder it got and when the van was cold, it would not shift into a better, a higher gear. 
Um, so we didn't think much about it. We had known that down the road this was a possibility. And we said, well, we can't afford to buy a new van. We're not going to do that. So we're weighing, so what happens if the transmission on this van goes? We know what it's going to cost. We've not been able to do this before. Well, it just so happens, and I think you have most of the story in there, uh, your prayer bolt in there, that it just so happened that when Bob and Judy leave town, they let us borrow their van, which works for us. Most of the time, we're a one-car one family. But when you have that one car breaks down, you need another car, don't you? Well, it just so happened that as our van was breaking down, Bob and Judy were in Florida, right? Uh, so I had called up and said, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to get this van in. Tanya had driven it to work, and I had to go get her. It wouldn't shift. She couldn't go anywhere, just sit there in the parking lot, and the engine would rev. And I said, well, it's, it's time to really get this thing and get it looked at going, how am I going to pay for this? We don't have money for this transmission. So I call up the transmission people, and they tell me about what I thought it was going to cost. So I said, well, let's take it in. Let's drive this van in there. You know, we're not going to have to pay for towing. We can't go over 35 miles an hour, so I'll have to go the back ways and stay on the main roads and so forth. And so I drive the van there, and Tanya's following me with the kids. Uh, so they fix the van. They call me up, and they say, well, it wasn't the transmission. And I'm like, well, that's good news, I think. <laughs> uh, this is what I had known was going to happen to my van. And they said, well, it was a little, it's called a, uh, some kind of packet. I can't remember the words now, but... Uh, and what it is, is it just gets a little problem in there and some, some seals don't seal right. The transmission fluid doesn't build up enough pressure and it can't shift to a higher gear. And they said, well, it's only going to cost about $350. And I was like, well, $350 comp compared to the cost of a new transmission, I can handle that. So I go to pick up the van. Uh, we go to get it and I start to talk to the guy that's there. And just, I'm just overjoyed that I'm getting off this easy, you know, with not having to replace a transmission. Uh, it was scheduled, I had called him and scheduled it for Thursday. Well, when we got to Tuesday, before that Thursday, it was no longer workable. And I said, well, we need to get this thing in. They said, well, we, or else we can get you in is Thursday. I said, well, fine, I'm bringing it today. Uh, you know, I can't drive it anyway. So I actually, I went to get the van on Thursday when I should have been dropping it off. So God is good and he's faithful. But there's more to the story. I'm talking to the guys, I'm picking the van up uh, and saying, you know, I'm just so grateful that this thing, it's not the transmission. Did the rest of it look okay? Am I going to be back in here in a week to do the transmission? You know, he said, no, it looks pretty good other than this. Uh, the van runs like new. I got, off, I got off really cheap. I got it done two days early. And he said, we also noticed that you had an engine light on. I said, oh, yeah, it has to do with something. He goes, it's not on anymore. He goes, and we fixed the transmission leak. So in reality, I think what had been happening is God had been preserving my van for all these years that that thing had been leaking fluid on my floor and that, and that light had been on in my van. Yet I didn't see it that way, did I? I saw it as this stupid van's going to break down. I'm going to have to pay a lot of money to have it fixed. And yet God says, hang on a second. How about if I get it to you early for about one-third of the price that you thought you were going to have to pay and I'll let you drive it for years before it actually breaks? before it should have that's the God I serve now if I focused on the visible things I could still be upset that I had to pay that much money to fix my van or I could as I was thinking through this this week I thought of the verse in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy I think it is where Moses is recalling the Israelites journey through the wilderness and he says for 40 years your shoes and your clothes did not wear out for so many years, the transmission in my van did not wear out. And that's God's faithfulness. And I would even suggest to you that's his supernatural ability to make something last beyond its years. I've seen him do it before. That's the kind of God that I can have faith in. Who I can trust in his promises. I can trust that he has the power to do it. And that he is secure in his authority and he is looking out for me. And that's where it's so difficult for us because we often don't think that. When all around us we see unemployment, we see economic difficulties, we see uh, failing health, we see difficult relationships, we see all these things. We're quick to lose faith in God's work because we don't see what He's doing. You see, Scripture teaches us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever which means that God cannot do something against His character. And what do we say around here? God is good, and all the time, whether we see it or not. And that's why it's important for us to maintain that identity and that purpose in our mind that God is good all the time. 
So even despite current circumstances and situations, he is doing what he said he will do even when you can't see it. In the case of Noah, who also makes it here in the Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 7, it says that Noah was warned by God concerning events yet unseen. God warned Noah about things that he couldn't see. See, God asked Noah to do something even before Noah saw the possibility of a problem. Do you realize that Noah had never seen rain? There's no rain before the time of Noah. You see, Noah was obeying God and following an instruction about something that he had no concept of. God says to Noah, it's going to rain. And Noah responds, it's going to what? God says, rain, water from the sky. And Noah says, oh, okay. And God says, no, I mean it, Noah. It's rain from the sky. And Noah says, okay, what do you want me to do? God's response, build an ark. Noah says, build an ark. Okay, wait a minute, build a what? A boat. No, it's going to rain a lot. Oh, okay, well, how big do you want it? Big enough to hold two of every kind of animal. Oh, okay. Why? Well, because they're going with you, Noah. With me, where am I going? You're going in the boat, Noah. It's going to rain a lot. Oh, okay. Well, why am I going in the boat? God says, well, how long can you swim? You see, and God knew what he was going to do beforehand. Noah had no idea. He couldn't see it. He didn't know. Maybe in your life you've seen a situation or circumstances after God was doing something and working something out that you could see now, but you couldn't see it then. That's the element of faith, and that's how it works in our lives. See, we can have faith and confidence in God's word, in his promises, in his power, in his character about who he is. When the world tells me that faith is foolish... God's word tells me that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. You see, there are many Christians in the world today who have faith in God, and they're looked at, like many of us, and they're ridiculed for faith in the unseen. But this is the shift that God asks to happen in us after we believe in him. And for many of us, it's still a process, and we're still growing. In verse 13 of Hebrews 11, it says this, These all died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. He's talking about they were even looking ahead to things that God was going to do throughout the course of history, things that Noah and Abraham didn't see. We used to sing a song, I say we, the cheerleaders used to sing a song, on the team bus coming home from away basketball games. Uh, It seemed to be one of their favorite things to do. And the song was, He's got the whole world in his hands. I don't know if they still do that or not, but are you familiar with that song? You want me to sing it for you? Because they would put every person on the bus, their name. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands, and it would be every person on the bus. He's got Jeff Elliott in his hands. And even while, to me, being a high school student, I was like, I'm not singing, you know, because we're manly men. We don't sing praise songs to God on the bus. We're macho basketball players, you know, and you cheerleaders can sing. I have to admit that in that moment when they were singing He's got Jeff Elliott in his hands. There was a sense of comfort there. It meant something to me. It was still important for me to hear that, even though I wouldn't acknowledge it. And it was something that girls do. There was a sense that I knew that God still had me in his hands, even at that age, before I could see what my life had in front of me. You see, a faith that demands something be seen is not faith, because we saw in verse 1, faith is things not seen. If I believed that the only things that existed were things that I could see, I'd be very disappointed. If this things that I can see on this earth, and on this planet, and this town, if this is all there is, I don't want it. I'd be very disappointed. So the question for you this morning is, how big is your God? And do you trust Him? Is your God big enough for you to have faith in Him, and what and that he is doing something you cannot see. 
You see, faith says, I do not know what God is doing, and I cannot see his hand, but I know that he is good, he is faithful and true, and he has promised, and he will do it. And all God's people said, that's moving from seen to unseen. But this shift requires more than faith. How do we live this out? How do we show that we have faith in God's promise and his power? It's one thing to have faith and to believe that God is able to do this. But how do we go about doing his work in a kingdom that we can't see? We're so quick to talk about faith and yet so slow to understand how to live it. You see, for us to work and for us to operate in this unseen kingdom, it requires something else. For us to function this way, we have to have focus. And that's the second thing in your outline this morning. We not only have to have faith, we have to have focus. We have to move our focus from things that we see to pursue things that are unseen, pursuing the kingdom of God. And you can see in in the times in the gospel when Jesus talks about the kingdom that the disciples totally missed the boat about what he was talking about. They so easily confused the coming Messiah, the Jewish Messiah that they expected with the coming kingdom of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. I want you to see something in this passage. When Jesus was here, he realized how easy it was for us to lose focus. How easy it was for us to concentrate on the things that are going on around us that we can see. Let's start reading in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's a fair question, isn't it? I can see food. I can see clothing. Those are things that I think I have to have. And Jesus says it's about more than that. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Have you ever thought about that? When you are anxious and worried about something, what have you added to your life besides stress? Verse 28, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first, what? The kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Jesus realized that we would get sidelined and sidetracked by things that we see, clothes and food. And he says, but seek first the kingdom. You have to have your focus on the kingdom of God. For us to live this out, our focus has to become from what's in front of us, from our daily concerns to what does God need for me to further his kingdom. You see, my goal is not to become rich or famous or successful. My goal is to please God and work to further his kingdom. When I am focused on his kingdom and I have made that switch from seen to unseen, that's when God is pleased. When my thoughts are not about food and clothes, but about How can I help the kingdom of God, the unseen kingdom? We know this from Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Have any of you seen that, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places? We've seen the effects of it. You see, our minds have to be focused on a kingdom, not of this world. And like the the verse in your bulletin says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In Mark chapter 8, 
Peter's been with Jesus for two years, and they get to in a pretty heated discussion. The word that the passage uses is rebuke, and they're kind of two Jewish guys going at it back and forth. And Peter is chastising Jesus for saying that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And Jesus says to Peter, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You're focused on the wrong thing, Peter. He says, Peter, your mind is in the wrong place. You're thinking about what is happening in the right here and now, right in front of you, that I tell you we go into Jerusalem and I'll be killed. And I have in mind the coming of the kingdom of God. You see, Peter, there's bigger things going on than you can see. That's really what I'm here for. So we have to stay focused on his kingdom. The second thing we have to be focused on as we try to live this out is focused on his call. Moving from a focus on our success to his glory. From our struggles to his sovereignty. From our failure to his triumph. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says this, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. It's a very powerful verse. It's kind of hidden in a, in a, in a different passage there. Let, the, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. See, we can easily be distracted by what God has called us to do and want something other. We can want a, a different calling than what God has given us. But when we're focused on his call, we're working for things that are unseen. And then we can begin to serve God with complete and absolute abandon because we know what he wants from us. When we are clear about what his call is. You see, we're here this morning and what we look around and we see a room full of people. And we can see such and such doesn't look so good or such and such needs a haircut. Or a pastor's putting on weight, which is not true. So if you're seeing that, you need to get your eyes checked. But we see things, right? And now you're really examining what it is that you see in this room. But what happens when God looks in this room? What does he see? I don't think he sees your haircut. He doesn't see your weight. He doesn't see your outward things that you worry about. He sees the condition of your soul, which is unseen to the rest of us. He sees your emotional state. Are you stressed out? Are you worried about something? Which we can't see. I can't see that by looking at you. He sees your concerns, what you wrote on your prayer card, which is still very real, but I haven't seen it. He sees what's going through your mind right now. And that's very real, but it's unseen. You see, God also knows how strong your faith is. He knows how much you rely on the seen or the unseen. Let me give you an example of how easily this, we can be misled about this. Uh, every February for the denomination, in order to keep my credentials, I have to fill out uh, a report. And two of the lines on there, actually the very first two lines, are two blanks. And the first one says, number of conversions. And the second line says, number of baptisms. And I've got to tell you, I get tired of putting zeros in the blank. And I'm honest about it. I would encourage them to come and ask me. And I've had this conversation with other pastors. I'm at this week, I'm meeting with, uh, this last week, I had a meeting with Jeff Getz, who's the director of the Eastern Region of the Missionary Church, really centered in New York City, doing a lot of things. And you remember a few years ago, I went out to see some of those pastors and was just fell in love with those guys and what they're doing and Jeff was back this week giving us a report and I was just man that's so great and that's so awesome that all those things are going on and for a second I should be honest more than a second I was a little jealous because I've been putting zeros in my blanks how many people have I seen saved how many baptisms have I done how many new members do you have and all those sorts of things and there's been some backlash to the denomination about well, you're focusing on wrong things, but those are good things. And as a church, I want, I want to share this burden with you that I don't like putting zeros in those blanks. And that's hard for me to do every year, and that'll cause you to evaluate yourself. And as I'm sitting in that meeting this week, and I'm getting a little jealous, and then it 
all of a sudden it just clears up for me. And God says, what have I called you to do? What is your call? Your call is not to New Jersey. You can rejoice and celebrate in those things that they're doing out there. But I've called you to be here. For as long as you put zeros in the blanks, you are my man in that place. So God has called me to be faithful to him in obedience. As much as I may want to put hundreds and hundreds of people in those blanks, God says you are successful if you're clear about my call and you're focused on my purpose. But you see how easy it is to be distracted by things that are seen, a zero on a blank, versus what God has called you to do? It's so easy for us as Christians to gauge our success by things that are seen. And God says, but I've called you to this. See, if you're clear about the call, everything else goes away. So I don't know what it is that God has called you to do. I'm sure he's called you. And I'm sure he's called you for something that will enhance and grow his unseen kingdom. And as we go through this study, maybe you'll see some shifts and maybe you'll understand more about what God wants to do in you. But I want to warn you about this danger because I saw it when I fill out that report. When I go to meetings and hear good things that God is doing about his kingdom in New York City. And I start to focus on, man, I want to go there and do that. And then in just a moment of clarity, God says, well, I've got you here doing this. Why is that more important than this? We fall prey to that, don't we? I did this week. And I hesitated to share that story because I was a pastor of not got this all figured out. But you know that by now. So as you go this week, and as we close this morning, the worship team can come up. Think about what are the, the seen things in your life that you're focusing on? How do you transfer into focusing on the unseen things of the kingdom of God? Because the reality of it is, when we're clear about God's call, we're clear about what he says, that my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. You're not accomplishing anything for my kingdom without me. So as we close this morning, we're going to sing, Your Grace is Enough. And it's kind of a, a faster song, but I want it to be a prayer for you because I need to sing this this morning that God, even though I was in love with what I heard from New York and New Jersey, and even though I'm tired of putting zeros in the blanks, your grace is enough for me and being faithful to your call. So stand this morning as we sing and, and close with this. God, we come to you this morning. There's times when we can't believe your grace is enough. We look around us and we see things that cause us problems and give us issues. But they're all things that we see. We surrender those to you, Lord. This kingdom of the unseen, we want to be all about that. Help us focus. Give us faith. Give us courage. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that give us strength and ministers to us in the times when we're so consumed with the things that we see. As we leave this morning, may you be honored by our lives, by our faith, and in being clear in our call to you. We ask these things in Christ's name and all God's people said, you are dismissed.